this cars is 100 a skill it's not knowledge you don't need to know anything but you got to practice it just like all skills phil back with another mcat podcast continuing our breakdown of the cars section of blueprint mcat full length one last week we went through passage one i think i was four out of six this week yep. hopefully is better with passage two hopefully hopefully, hopefully. better <laughs> yeah all right what do I we think got there's seven questions with this one so i mean you got you get, you get an extra shot right all right um i think this question isn't quite as bad as the previous one so our second passage here is about cargo cult behaviors so cargo cult behaviors provide opportunity for cultural anthropologists uh, examining millenarian legends. Once again, we got some new terms. More important is the Western discourse that has grown up around cargo cults, which we shall simply call the cargo cult myth. This myth represents an insidious form of Western imperialism with, at its roots, two per pervasive facets of Western culture, materialism and paternalism. So... Right off the bat, the author here is not neutral. The author has some real strong feelings, right? Um, this myth represents the insidious form of the Western imperialism, so it's insidious and there's maybe not a fan. Um, we also have this like millenarian legend stuff, and then the very next sentence, more important, is the Western discourse. So the author is telling us that this is really what we care about. And so whatever's going on with the millenarian legends, I got no idea. But it tells me that what the author is actually cares about here is like what how this is related to the Western discourse. Um, so the Western discourse on cargo cults. What's a cargo cult? I got no idea. Right? <laughs> like this is this is this is new stuff um, going on here. So we have these two parts of this: this Western, which the author is not a fan of this Western imperialism, not a fan of materialism, and not a fan of paternalism. And so, like highlighting those things as I go along. Um, important to recognize what it is that the author actually cares about. So the Melanesian islands house groups of tribal peoples who for thousands of years have no contact with outsiders. Staging ground preparations in World War II saw an influx of Japanese and American soldiers into the islands. The sudden contact with advanced industrial society came as a shock to the Melanesians. Seeing large cargo planes dropping huge crates of supplies, often shared with the locals by the servicemen, created societal upheavals. To the Melanesians, only the gods could be powerful enough to bestow such amazing material wealth. So the soldiers were seen as priests, who had some special power to please the gods and bring them cargo. When the war ended, the servicemen departed. In response, the tribesmen began performing religious rituals to bring the cargo back. They built mock airstrips in the jungle, began dressing in outfits designed to mimic the soldiers' uniforms, and even began parading around in imitation of military drills and formations. This is actually pretty interesting now that I'm looking at this. You know, yeah. the Melanesian islands, like they, they're they pretending they're in the military to try to get airplanes to come back. <laughs> so anthropologists and other Western observers, first seeing this behavior, reacted with amused paternalism. Once again, something the author is not a fan of, right? Early publications made comparisons to children playing house. Theodore Schwartz and Peter Lawrence, two of the first anthropologists to study cargo cults, laid down what became the basic tenets of the cargo cult myth. Schwartz wrote extensively on how Melanesians had a great emphasis on demonstration of material wealth. Local chieftains were often the ones who could most, uh, who could most ostent ostentatiously display their status through goods. The arrival of enormous quantities of material wealth from the cargo containers was jarring, demonstrating the vastly higher status of the Japanese and American servicemen. Lawrence focused on indigenous value systems that predated the cargo cults and suggested again that the materialism and provincialism of the Melanesian tribes created the necessary preconditions for cargo cult development. And so we have this, these like these people of the islands were used to determining like your stance in society on how much stuff you had and then these soldiers came in and they got way more stuff. <laughs> so going into this, so it wasn't until the 1962 documentary film Mondo Kane, however, that the cargo cult myth became widely known and the accepted discourse inside and outside of academia. This so-called documentary caught the public's imagination. An explosion of films, books, and scholarly articles followed, each further emphasizing the materialism and backwardness of the tribesmen. 
While contemporary eyes may be offended by the paternalism of his early work, is there any truth to it? Schwartz and Lawrence were no academic lightweights. Each had a long and successful career as academic cultural anthropologists, and their work, although dated, should not be wholly dismissed. So we know the author is not a fan of this paternalism, materialism stuff, but on the other hand, the, the author here is kind of couching their opinion a little bit and saying, well, you know, the people who came up with these, they're not, like, you can't just dismiss them because they're pretty serious academics. Yep. So the truth of the cargo cult myth, I love this. The author's just going to be like, here's the truth. Um, so the truth of the cargo cult myth lies in its attempt to tie how Melanesians viewed material wealth with their behavior after incurred, encountering industrial industrialized society. Most Melanesian tribes followed a big man pattern in which the political authority was held by the person best able to give away material gifts. The current big man could be displaced at any time by another individual who is capable of giving away more and bigger gifts. With no formal authority structures and no heritable authority, the pressure on a big man to continuously build and give away material wealth is large. When the servicemen begin casually giving away things like extra ration tins, extra clothing, and other manufactured goods, the tribesmen perceive them as big men, the likes of which had never been encountered. The notion that cargo cults that later developed were materialistic had a grain of truth, but the materialism was entirely at odds with the Western acquisition or acquisitive notion of material wealth. So the author is saying here that the materialism that's being exhibited here by the Melanesians is different than the the like materialism seen yeah. in like these Western cultures. Yeah. And so it seems it's more about like giving away stuff um, that is like the material that's kind of important within these Melanesians. So it is a in a way a material um, you know focused society, but it's it's focused on giving rather than like acquiring which yeah. is what the western notion is are you a fan so, of as as a student is reading this the the thing that comes to mind as as we were reading that and as you were talking is this this is very similar to the the big man right who who do we have as a big man in our country well the the president who we elect and oh the, he gives away uh, tax breaks and he gives away all the stuff that he's going to promise on the campaign trail. It's very similar kind of thinking there. Yeah, that's actually really interesting. I hadn't I hadn't gone there, but now the moment that you you bring that up, I'm like, oh yeah, there's some very clear analogies that can be made in this. Does do it help a thing, student do that? Do you think? I think it helps to understand it. Maybe. Mm -hmm. I think on the other hand, though, you have to be really careful not to bring in your own viewpoints. You need to still make sure that whatever you choose as your answer has something in the passage to help you get there. Um, and you're not just going off of your interpretation, your analogies. I, I'll admit there are times when I'm reading stuff um, that I will do some similar things. I'll, I'll be like, oh, this is like that one you know, person I know in my family or something. Yeah. And, and like it's hard to stop that. And if it helps you understand it better, that's good. But you, you have to be really careful. Um, not to choose answers based on that outside information, um, but it's still got to come from the passage whatsoever. Okay. So I guess, you know, I guess the the short answer to that is if it helps you understand what's in the passage, it's good. If it starts going beyond that, it's a problem. Okay. And so making sure that it's relevant to that itself. Okay. All, All right. right. So question, question number seven, which of the following actions is most likely to be taken by the big man in a typical Melanesian tribe? Answer choice A, performing, uh, perform elaborate rituals that mimic behaviors of Japanese military service men during World War II. B, encourage his tribe to attack a neighboring tribe to acquire their possessions. C, have a paternalistic view towards other tribes that began a cargo cult. D, give livestock and weapons away to members of a neighboring group to increase his status with that group. So it's just what we're talking about, right? The big man is the one who's giving away stuff. The one who has the the stuff to give away is the one who has a, a bigger um, place in the in that in their world. The thing that potentially throws me off, and I probably trips up a lot of students, is that answer choice D: give away livestock, give give livestock and weapons away to members of a neighboring group. So it's like, wait a minute, that is that. Is that wrong because it's a neighboring group? It should be within his his or her own group. Um, so I'm going to put that one on the back burner for now and just look at the other one. So A, perform elaborate rituals, right? That was part of what we read was 
like dressing up like servicemen, but that really had nothing to do with being the big man. That was just what they all did because they wanted more more cargo to f- fall from planes. Um, right. So A's, that's exactly that thing we were talking about last time about scratching this itch where yeah. you're like, I read that. That's a thing, but it doesn't really answer the question because yeah. that doesn't have anything to do with the big men specifically. Yeah. B encourages tribe to attack a neighboring tribe to acquire their possessions. That seems logical, right? It's like, well, if you have more possessions, then you can give them away. So let's go attack and and take them away. So that one's, I'm like, oh, maybe, right? That's kind of opposite of D, which is like, give it away, but it's to the neighboring group. So, Mm -hmm. oh, man. Uh, C, have a paternalistic view towards other tribes that began a cargo cult. No, that's the that's uh, the Western world having the paternalistic view. So B and B and D are my go to here. It didn't really talk about attacks on other tribes, but I don't know if that's we have to like go beyond what we read. But because how are they going to get the possessions? Well, you have to go take them from someone, um, or you just whittle some wood all day long. Um, <laughs> But really, D D is the most seems like it's the most right because it's like yeah, you're just giving away livestock and weapons, and it's a, to another group. But that's exactly what you want to do. You want to build your status to everyone. So I'm gonna go with D just because I'm super confused. Yeah, yeah, no, there's that one definitely. Like if if you didn't look at the answer choices, and I ask you like, what is it that a big man does? You're gonna say like give away stuff. Yeah. And so that's why I think it's kind of useful to try to predict answers because the answer is D. It's just, you know, kind of giveaway stuff. There's something to be really careful of because B makes sense when you like logic your way through it. Mm-hmm. But note that they say acquire their possessions. And so the very last sentence of the passage is saying that the materialism of, you know, the Melanesians was completely at odds with the the Western acquisitive or acquiring notion of materialism and so it turns out i'd say b is actually maybe more of a western um viewpoint of like acquiring materials yeah all right yeah i think part of part of b made me i was reading into it what wasn't there was encourage his tribe to attack a neighboring tribe to acquire their possessions so that he can give them away Right. And so that that's exactly what you're doing. You're kind of like going too deep, thinking too much. Yeah. I think that that's something that is really important as somebody dealing with cars, that you're not being an analyst. You're not like coming up with scenarios and that sort of thing. What you're doing instead is being a reporter. You're mm. reporting on what the passage said. Mm. And so like what exactly is going on there? Like they didn't say anything about going to war, taking stuff to give away or anything like that. So anything that you bring in there is not actually existing. Yep. And so you can't bring that info in. Okay. All right, question eight. The author's attitude toward the work of Schwartz and Lawrence can best be described as A, deeply appreciative, B, disgusted and dismissive, yeah, C, disinterested but admiring, D, skeptical with measured respect. Ooh, this is a hard one. So the, he, the author at one point did say that Schwartz and Lawrence were no academic lightweights, long, successful career. So that's some respect there. So that right away is like, okay, that potentially. Skeptical doesn't seem like a strong enough word for how the author started it with the, um, uh, the, the thought process. I don't even know where it is right now, but it seemed like it was a little bit more negative. But that respect part is interested disinterested but admiring is almost that whole respect thing as well disgusted and dismissive seems too strong deeply appreciative obviously is wrong so i'm gonna go skeptical and measured with measured respect yeah it's that like one sentence where they they talk about you know their work though dated should not be wholly dismissed that's telling you the author thinks it's a little bit dated but yep can't just dismiss it um c is tempting i'll give you that that admiring thing like they're they have this like heavy academic career the, the problem is disinterested yeah like I, I don't think the author would say like I, i'm not interested i don't care about any of this i mean he, he wrote the whole passage on it. <laughs> um, yeah. so obviously they're they're not they're interested somewhat in it yep so question number nine the passage suggests that the cargo cult myth is founded largely on a the work of early anthropologists such as schwartz and lawrence B, popularity of the film Mondo Kane. C, desire of the Melanesian tribesmen to acquire manufactured goods. Or D, need of Melanesian big men 
to attain or to maintain their status? Oh, this seems like a trap question because it's the cargo cult myth is founded, not necessarily what the tribesmen were doing. Right. Right. So there's a lot of answers in here that are scratching itches. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a thing, right? All four of these are in the passage somewhere and yeah, you can talk yourself into it with enough time. So C and D I'm going to throw out right away because that's, that's what happened. That wasn't the myth around what happened. Um, and so the question is the, where's the myth from now? The, the Mondo Cain talked about, um, the 1962 documentary that the cargo cult myth, it was not until that film that the cargo cult myth became widely known in the accepted discourse inside and outside of academia. So that seems like that's what it is founded on potentially but uh, so so i think that's a trap because really the documentary documentary is that how you said? um <laughs> like uh, losing work yeah right? so that's it, what happens when you do enough cars yeah my guess is that the documentary was founded on the work of Schwartz and Lawrence. And so that had to come first. And so what is it all founded on? It's founded on their work. And so I'm going to go with A. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I do want to like warn you and other students, like your, your thought process. Great. The problem was it was a thought process. <laughs> and like the, the, for this, I'm just going to go back and find it. Right. Like, where did it start? So if I go back to the Mondo Kane thing. Yeah. It wasn't until this documentary film Mondo Kane that the cargo myth, cult myth became widely known and accepted, which means that it existed before. It just wasn't accepted. Yeah. And then if you go to the, the Schwartz and Lawrence in the paragraph above Theodore Schwartz and Peter Lawrence, two of the first anthropologists to study cargo cults, laid down what became the basic tenets of the cargo cult myth. And so they're saying, like, oh, they created the cargo cult myth. And so your thought process, absolutely great. And if you're in a science section, I think it's a good idea. But within cars, you always have to be careful and just like, oh, like, what do they say? Yeah. Um, did I get so it right? I, did I got it right, didn't yeah, I? Yeah, you're right. Okay. It, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. You got it correct. Yeah. Okay. You, now, now you're questioning everything. <laughs> yeah. It was the Schwartz and Lawrence. Yeah. Okay. Report. Report. Don't. Uh, Don't analyze. Don't and analyze. that honestly is one of the hardest things for students in cars because you have to learn because what that analyzing stuff is what makes you so good at the sciences. That's what makes you successful in the sciences. And so you're being rewarded constantly for doing this on um, three fourths of the test. And then you get to this section and students will want to do the same thing, right? Kind of like basin, like operant conditioning. If you're rewarded for something, you want to do it more often. Yep. And so you have to take this and just kind of like crumple that analytic viewpoint <laughs> in your mind. You have to crumple that into a ball and chuck it out with all the info um, and like not let yourself do that, which is hard because you have to change your thought process, which is way harder than learning a fact. Yep. 10, the cargo cult myth assumes which of the following ideas? Uh, this is a, a Roman numeral one. So Roman numeral one, Melanesian tribesmen have a materialistic view of the world. Two, Melanesians believe that their mock runways could attract cargo planes to bring them material wealth. Three, the isolation of Melanesians left them ignorant and backwards. So the cargo cult myth. So tribesmen have a materialistic view of the world right that's the that's what the western world is saying that they're just all materialistic so that seems correct melanesians believe that their mock runways could attract cargo planes um it seems like it, I, i'm i'm hesitating on that one because that's what they did but is that part of the myth so i i'm gonna say that's correct because um even though that is what they did that's that's what they're also saying too is that's part of like oh they're so materialistic look they built they built mock runways to get more mm-hmm. um, and three the isolation of Melanesians left them ignorant and backwards so my guess is that a lot of students are going to reject number three just like um, intrinsically like oh that's mean and and they weren't mm-hmm. ignorant and backwards they were just isolated but the myth is that they're ignorant and backwards and that. They they were super materialistic, I think. So I'm going to go with one, two, and three. 
Yeah, very good. I love that you're kind of like latching on to and thinking like, how are students going to tackle this? Because a lot of them are going to read that and they're going to be like, no, they're not ignorant backwards. And to be honest, the passage kind of supports that. The author of the passage is saying that, you know, those assumptions are possibly incorrect. Yep. But the question is asking like, what's the myth? And that's that's what the myth is saying. I think that that's a constant battle a lot of students are struggling with, myself included, when I first started. I was seeing a question like this and trying to show that I'm a reasonable, ethical, moral human, so please let me into med school. I want to be a doctor, right? But that's not what this this is testing. Yeah. It's testing, do you understand their viewpoints or the different viewpoints going on in the passage? And so you got to be careful not to bring in stuff, even when it seems like really fundamental, like shouldn't murder people or like indigenous people are not ignorant right and like stupid like you have to be really careful and not bring in that outside info so question 11 according to the author the cargo cult myth a owes its popularity to film representation b can be understood as a morbid fascination by western audiences with morally backwards but technologically advanced tribal peoples c was developed entirely by the work of schwartz and lawrence D was weakened by paternalistic facets of Western societies. Mm. I love a couple of these answers because right away I'm like, oh, I can get rid of that. Right. So answer choice C was developed entirely by the work of Schwartz and Lawrence. Well, no, they they were the foundation, um, but then it was built on more after that documentary. So I'm going to throw out C. Uh, Answer choice D was weakened by paternalistic facets of Western societies. I think that was the whole, the whole myth was that's, it's supported by the paternalistic facets. So that one is just opposite. Uh, B can be understood as a morbid fascination by Western audiences with morally backwards, but technologically advanced tribal people. They weren't technologically advanced, so that's just wrong. So... And it's going to go with A, owes its popularity to the film representations, which is the one documentary and then some other stuff that came. Yeah. So not only did B, C, and D just not make sense, which you're ag- absolutely correct, um, the fourth paragraph really supports this idea that this Mondo Kane is what led to this cargo cult myth becoming widely known. All right. Question 12. What does the author most strongly imply regarding the uh, cargo cult myth? A, it is a myth precisely because it has no factual basis in the realities of Melanesian life. B, it ultimately reveals more about negative Western perceptions of tribal groups than an accurate representation of those tribal groups. C, accurately represents the key facets of cargo cults, both in how they originally developed and in how uh, how they are maintained to this day. Or D, it understates the key impact that material wealth plays in Melanesian society. So this is, what is the author? What does the author most strongly imply regarding the myth? Um, So the author seems to be very much that this is a myth. It's not based on fact. It's based on this whole paternalistic Western view of what happened and what's going on. So A seems like a very good answer. B, it ultimately reveals more about the negative Western perceptions of tribal groups rather than the accurate representation of those tribal groups. That seems like a really good one too. Um, C, it's, accurately represents the key facets of cargo cults, both in how they originally developed, how they maintain today. So no, I don't think that's correct. And then D, it understates the key impact material wealth plays in Melanesian society. I think that's false as well. So A and B are weird. So A, they both seem correct. Um, the, the one part that seems to me like makes a wrong is it saying it has no factual basis in realities of melanesian life but obviously there has to be some parts that are true and then the myth obviously expands on them so i'm gonna go with answer choice b yeah yeah very good that like no factual basis is kind of an extreme statement like you have to find a passage somewhere that says there are no facts and the author is saying like you know there's the schwartz and what's his face lawrence lawrence um that had you know you can't just like wave away their stuff but i think the real reason i don't want to pick a is that the last paragraph the notion that cargo cults um that later developed were materialistic had a grain of truth 
And so the author like is telling you here there is a grain of truth to this. Yep. And so saying there's no factual basis, we can't really go along with that. Yep. Um, yeah, so the answer is B. All right, question All right, Last question of the passage. We're one away from a perfect score on this one. <laughs> so which of the following assertions would most challenge the primary argument in this passage? A. Mondo Kane was seen as a valid exercise of documentary filmmaking by nearly all who viewed it. B. The Melanesians who carried out cargo cult behavior did not believe they were actually summoning cargo planes, but rather their ancestral spirits. C. The Western discourse on Melanesians was respectful of their social systems and sought to understand cargo cult behavior in light of the tribe's own history and values. And D. The big man description of tribal social structures was itself first constructed by Theodore Schwartz. Hmm. So... I have to go back to the question, which assertion would challenge the primary argument in the passage? The question is, what is the primary argument in the passage? And so I think the primary argument is basically how this myth is just a myth, and that's not how who these people are. I think that's mm-hmm. what the argument is. Um, and so which one would say flip that and go, no, the, the the myth is real. This is who these people are. Potentially, I think that's what, the one I'm trying to find. So, A, Mondo Cain was seen as a valid exercise of documentary filmmaking by nearly all who viewed it. I don't know if that would challenge it. Um, that's interesting. So basically saying, no, it was reported perfectly. Um, that's who these people are. B, the Melanesians who carried out cargo cult behavior did not believe they were actually summoning cargo planes, but rather their ancestral spirits. And so again, the the whole thing that this was a myth, um, I don't know if that would challenge the argument. C, the Western discourse on Melanesians was respectful of their social systems and sought to understand cargo cult behavior in light of the tribe's own history and values. C sounds like it's the most strong. Uh, B, the big man description of tribal social structures uh, was constructed. Doesn't seem like it's right. I'm going to go with C here because it seems like right. The, the argument of the passage is this is just a myth. These aren't who these people are. Stop treating them badly. And Answer choice C is, oh, no, we're going to treat them nicely and just really say what happened here and respect everything. So right. that, that would flip it. That would challenge it. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I think some of these other ones do maybe conflate or like conflict with some of the stuff in the passage, but we're looking for what's going to challenge the main argument, which is that this cargo cult myth uh, was not great because of Western stuff. Yeah. Like we were paternalistic and our materialism kind of like ruined our interpretation of this. Um, yeah. So C's the right answer. All right. Perfect score. That might be a yeah. first for me getting a perfect score on a, on a science, uh, a cars passage. Just, yeah. just a reminder, like I could, the cars when I took it, verbal reasoning was what it used to be called. Like that was my uh-huh. worst section. I got a, a seven, which is, um, what is that now? Like a, a one, what is that now? 124, maybe? 123? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, maybe 125. I don't know. I forget what the section breakdowns are. I know overall yeah. it was about a 502 that I got, but um, that, that verbal reasoning section held me down. And it's really been doing all this practice um, on these podcasts that, that have really go, okay, now I know how to think like the MCAT thinks. Yeah, cars cars is 100% a skill. It's not knowledge. You don't need to know anything, but you got to practice it just like all skills. You can't like master a unicycle by reading a book like how to read a unicycle <laughs> for dummies, right? Like you can't develop that skill unless you're actually like practicing yeah. and putting effort. And cars is the same way. I would say cars is the one section of the test you cannot cram because it's a skill. You can cram knowledge. I I'm not saying you should, but you can. Yeah. cram like magnetism like in a day you'll sit down like i'm gonna learn magnetism today at the end of the day you're magneto right? <laughs> like, you don't have to worry about that but with cars it doesn't work that way because it's a skill it takes this kind of constant pressure um and that that's how you improve yeah 